Saul's story is so dramatic. It is so well known even among a lot of non-church people that it has almost become a cliché. Some people like to use this story as a kind of insider shorthand. My Damascus Road experience was like this. They talk about the scales falling off of their eyes and claim the story from Acts as a metaphor for their own transformation. Madeline LeEngle, the author of the award-winning novel A Wrinkle in Time, once told an audience this, Conversion for me was not a Damascus Road experience. I slowly moved into an intellectual acceptance of what my intuition had always known. That's the way things come clear. All of a sudden, and then you realize how obvious they've been all along. I don't know about you, but that resonates with me whenever I think of my faith journey. I've never had a blinding light experience like Saul, a sudden moment when my life completely changed and it became either unraveled or kind of woven back together. For me, the experience of Christ in my life has come more in retrospect as I have looked back and been comforted by the ways that God has always been in my life and is continuing to work in my life. There is something so comforting about having such an early faith identity, but when you compare it with this story from Acts, it lacks drama. The big aha, and it kind of seems inadequate. The word for conversion is the Greek word metanoa. Translated literally, it means change of heart or change of mind. It usually gets trans, um, translated also as repentance. But metanoa is something bigger than that. The word itself doesn't appear in the scripture from the ninth chapter of Acts, but what we are observing in this compelling narrative is metanoa. Saul having a change of heart, a change of mind, becoming unraveled, and then weaving slowly back together again. It was a radical conversion for Saul. And this text includes a life-changing moment for the disciple Ananias. Saul was a young Pharisee introduced in this chapter as one so zealous in his faith that he is willing to participate in violence to protect it. When you are brought up in the violence of the empire, it can be tempting to replicate that violence. Saul, likely fearful of the fate of his own faith under Roman domination, turned that fear into violence against those he saw as threatening his faith, particularly those who followed the radical teacher, Jesus. Jesus, who had been killed and whose followers, like Stephen, were willing to face death even as they shared the good news of the message. We are told that Saul had no patience for those who defamed God and drew unnecessary and dangerous attention to their people. Dr. Mitzi Smith, when writing about this passage, says, God reveals God's self to whomever God chooses and when God chooses. And Saul, who had already believed in God fiercely, was the recipient of this revelation. 
Saul, who was well-educated and well-connected, a Pharisee who was a son of a Pharisee, a Roman citizen when many weren't, weren't, could not use all his political or social connections to work his way out of this startling encounter with Christ on the road to Damascus. A light from heaven flashed above and he fell to the ground and the world that he thought he saw so clearly becoming nothing before his eyes. Jesus, long gone from this world, but moving through the Holy Spirit, speaks to him and sets him on the journey to a new life and a new mission. First, Saul will have to rely on his friends to lead him safely into the city. I wonder if you caught that little tidbit in the text. Saul has to depend on others because following Christ is rarely done on our own. Then a disciple named Ananias will come and lay hands on him, preparing him for the work of the gospel and offering Saul the chance to make amends for all of the wrongs that he has done in the world. It's definitely a second chance, a change of heart, a change of mind, a metanoia, an unraveling. When Saul, whom we now know as Paul, accepts this blessing and is baptized, we know from this vantage point in history that we are seeing a world-changing ministry begin. Whatever had been preventing Paul from seeing a hopeful future fell away, and he was able to begin anew. Now, I don't know if your transformation story is more like mine, slow and steady throughout your life. Or maybe it's more like Saul, who had his heart turned from fear and anger into hope and love. But I bet you do have a transformation story. Maybe you're even having a transformation story right now, moved by what is happening in our world and in our nation. Maybe this time of separation, isolation, and unrest has unraveled you in some way. And you are like Saul, in need of something to turn your fear and your anger into hope and into love. However you come to see the thing that changes you, I hope you are able to get up and go do whatever it is that Christ is calling you to do at this moment. Your life and this world can change. Whenever Christ comes to us and speaks to us, we become unraveled. We have that change of heart, that change of mind, and we are set on a new path, a new direction. This story reminds us that great transformation is possible. I pray that your eyes and your ears may be open to seeing and hearing things anew, to listening and seeing the ways in which Christ is still at work in this world. That Christ is still at work in the unraveling and, and also the weaving us back together. Calling us again and again and again to new life in him. In the name of God the creator, the redeemer and sustainer. Amen.